What's going on everybody, C4, welcome back to the channel, and today, we're on Tuesday, the draft's in two days, a little bit of a late upload, today was tax day, so I'm a little depressed, but uh, I wanted to get my final Philadelphia Eagles mock draft out there, tomorrow, Wednesday, draft eve, I will drop my final 32 team mock draft, just trying to make some predictions of who I think is going to go where, but I wanted to obviously do one just specifically for my Philadelphia Eagles. The last Eagles mock draft I did, I felt really good about it. And I did do trades. I do think Philly is going to do trades. Especially with two first round picks and Howie Roseman as our general manager. But for this mock draft, we're just going to play it simple. And we're just going to act as is for the picks that the Philadelphia Eagles have. And that's frustrating. I can tell you right now. Philly, between what we the two picks we have in the first round and then waiting all the way to pick 51 in the second round... Constant blue balls for all of those selections of like, there's three guys that we really want to fall at pick 15. That's our first pick in the first round. They almost always go in mock drafts. There's three or four guys. Like, like all the good safeties that I would want in the second round literally go within the first, like the last five picks or the first five picks before the Eagles pick in the second round. That's just the nature of the beast. Uh, we'll talk about some scenarios quickly for some of these picks. But for this mock draft, the final mock draft, we won't do any trades. If you want to see what kind of trades I would look at doing, just go look at my last Philadelphia Eagles mock draft, which is probably a couple weeks ago. It's been a minute. So let's get into it. Uh, another new creation with seven rounds to do fast, no trades. Hey, let's go. Uh, this has always kind of been like, that's one thing I don't like about this site. Use NFL mock draft database. I think it looks the cleanest. Uh, and there's also, I don't do, I, I have no problem doing face cam, but there's really no good way to fit the face cam in here. You don't need to see me. You'd rather probably see the boards player available, players that have gone. Um, but looking at how things have kind of broke down again at pick 15, this is like one of those things where like, uh, you watch everyone here get outside the top 10. Like once it gets to 10, those next five picks are very painful for the Philadelphia Eagles. I desperately hope, first of all, that Drake London goes before the Eagles pick and then I don't have to worry about because literally I can't see any player like outside of probably going a quarterback here. And I'll tell you right now, Malik Willis is still on the board at 15. Philly is 100% trading back. But outside of a quarterback, I genuinely don't think there's going to be there's players that I that I'd be like, "Meh, sure." Like a Kyle Aftis selection here, I'd be like, you know, he's I'm not as high in him as others, but he's a fine edge rushing player. And that's a premium position, a position that Philly needs to get better at. And he, I'm sure he'd be fine. But yeah, the guys like that that I'd be like, yeah, you know, kind of good. We're probably not going to go line, almost certainly not going to go linebacker. But if Drake London's out the board, there's probably no one that I'd be really upset with at this spot. But you start seeing at 10. Like, I'd be happy with Kyle Hamilton at 15. Jordan Davis at 15. Derek Stingley at 15. Trent McDuffie at 15. All those guys, like, that's that's the bad draw. That's the problem, the issue with where Philly is and not doing trade-up scenarios because we have the assets to move up. I think Philly should, but... Uh, mock drafts are depressing for the Eagles because, you know, you're kind of picking from the scraps, the scrap pile. So look at that 15 and 18. Knowing that we're not trading, this is where I think first at 15, we got to go best wide receiver available. Really the two picks now, there's no safety. I don't think that's worthy of one of these selections. It's coming down to the wide receivers and corners. And I don't think you have to worry about the Saints or the Chargers nabbing a corner. I think we'll have our pick of, of whoever's left there. So then you look at the wide receivers. This is very tough because... I'm a George pick and stand, but I really, really, you know, I, I, it'd be, if like Philly got pickets, they brought him in for the visit, uh, which is smart because he does have some red flags off the field. He's a fiery personality, but I, I just love the idea of George Pickens in the second round. I don't know how much I love the idea of him in the first round outside of the fact that I like the player. I, I think it's a slight reach to get him in the first round. Then you look at like Jahan Dotson would be interesting for Philadelphia, maybe too similar to a certain degree, as Devontae Smith. Same goes for Olave. I mean, today's NFL is all about building a wide receiver core. You need guys that complement each other. You need guys that can offer things that other players can't. You have Traylon Burks, who I really like. But there's a developmental aspect of Traylon Burks' game. He ran a lot of snaps out of the slot, ran a lot of easy routes. Arkansas just found the way to get the ball in his hands as quickly as possible. That... He's going to need some development. And, I, you know, while we've seen Philadelphia's new coaching staff develop Quez Watkins. Quez Watkins took a big step last season, relatively, for where he was at, you know, as a rookie. Um, I, I'm, I'm still just nervous anytime Philly gets a guy that needs development. Jameson Williams. That is where we're going to go. I think he's a very good player. He's the best deep threat in this draft. And I think if I'm Philadelphia, you know, I think, you know, you get someone like Olave that might be the safer player, maybe less boom, less bust with Chris Olave. But Chris Olave is very similar 
to you know what we have in Devonte Smith, and I, and I don't necessarily think Philadelphia is going to eliminate someone like Chris Olave because he's very similar to Devonte Smith. We saw their interest in Calvin Ridley making a trade with the Falcons, and Calvin Ridley, you know, kind of slim reaper ish himself. You know, not not necessarily the the best deep threat, not necessarily the best jump ball guy. He's just kind of like you know do it all, well rounded player. Um, but when you look at Jameson Williams. I think the thing with the, with the knock that I've had against Jameson Williams, he's one of the best deep threats. He's an electrifying playmaker, but it's just does his skill set suit what we have right now in Jalen Hurts? And the answer is not really. You know, for how limited Jalen Hurts' deep ball is, I feel like personally, Quez Watkins is probably a good enough option just to be sending him down the field and having him run those routes because Jalen Hurts can't really hit them with any form of consistency. But I do also think speed kills Quez Watkins and Jameson Williams. Absolutely, good luck covering that. And also, I think now that you got to view the fact that Philly's acquired and we trade it back, and we have two first-round picks next year, it's kind of that insurance that if Jalen doesn't pan out, we're going to get a quarterback next year. So I think it's fair to assume that if you're assuming that Philadelphia is, mo- is I'm not going to say most likely, but Philly, Philly's likely to get a quarterback next year, you know, you got to look at these wide receivers as wide receivers that can go with you know a, a franchise-style quarterback, a quarterback that can make the deep ball throws. And then, then that... That looks a lot more interesting. Like if I was, for example, if I was the Buffalo Bills, if I was the Buffalo Bills at pick fifteen, Jameson Williams is my guy. I need someone that can get on the end of Josh Allen's bombs. Jameson Williams, out of all the guys right here, can do that. So if you're looking at this from the Philadelphia Eagles and you're looking at the fact that in 2023 they're going to be looking for a new quarterback, this this pick makes a lot of sense because Jameson Williams gives you, you know, the one of the like I don't even think going into next year's draft class, there's a guy that as, as a pure deep threat can offer what Jameson Williams offers at this point. And, and I, I even highlighted when I was, I even shout out to the people that support my Patreon, that the last game that Jameson Williams played, unfortunately before the injury in the championship, there was no John Mechie. So they, they didn't strictly use him as the guy that takes the top out of the defense. They, they made him run a couple like what John Mechie was, guy over the field, move the chains, couple easy throws. And he was, he was pretty solid. So I don't think he's necessarily a purely only strictly deep threat wide receiver, but that's exactly what you'd be banking on him bringing to the next level at the NFL. And yada, 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 long story short, the Jameson Williams selection for me is not so much about getting a guy that can maximize Jalen Hurts right now. You know, hey, you know, he's going to, he's, as much as I love Quez Watkins, Jameson Williams is going to be a better deep threat than Quez Watkins day one. That's not saying Quez can't be good. That's not saying they can't coexist. You can never have enough deep threats. Point being, the Jameson Williams selection that I've kind of been against to a certain degree, that's just thinking that Jalen Hurts is the quarterback of her future. If we need a new quarterback that can actually hit the deep ball, hey, uh, you know, the guy that threw him the football a lot last year at Alabama, if we get him, God willing, this, this is a great pick. This is a great pick for us. So that's where we're going, Jameson Williams. A lot of it went right there. We have 18 pending. Now we're back here. Um, and looking at the big board for Philadelphia, I mean, we're not, you, could, you know, you could go litter bomb. Again, I have an issue pretty much red shirting a center. You know, it's not it's not a great position of value. You know, Devontae Wyatt, who Philadelphia did bring in for a top 30 visit. The issue is the off the field. Uh, you know, more of a Dallas Cowboy pick at this point. Plus, he's old. He's a little bit older. I think the player's solid. The value at 18 is not bad. I just think the off the field stuff, I, I don't know, man. And then you got, because you got Karloftis here. Right. Really, it comes down to either getting Karlaftis or one of these two corners. And now I have Gator Bias. Yes, I do think Kyler Elam is incredibly slept on right now in this draft process. I think that the amount of people that are throwing, not I'm saying actually throwing out, but the amount of people that are giving someone like Derek Stingley a break over the last couple of years, and they're like, well, remember when he was unbelievably dominant as a freshman? I think, you know, like, you know, that's fair. That's, that's fair. I view that as well. But yeah, I think that it's also fair to view that for Kyrie Elam. Kyrie Elam as a freshman was outstanding for Florida. Year two was very good for Florida. Year three, everything Todd Grantham, the Gators DC touch, was absolute garbage. One of the worst defensive coordinators in all of college football. And I think Kyrie Elam brings out, you know, island potential. Put him on an island potential. You have Andrew Booth here, who I've actually seen like a lot of conflicting reports if he's going to be a zone corner, struggling zone. I, I think he's, he's solid in run defense. I don't, I you know... I, that screams Gator bias, and if you're going for value, you look at the edge rusher. But I think the drop off at corner is kind of scary for me on the turnaround because if you don't go corner for Philadelphia right now, we have you know Zach McPherson as a starting outside corner. Like the drop off once we get to 50, 51 range, you're looking at like project player, slot corner. You know, eh, like you know we're gonna be looking at guys that might be able to contribute and play right away sooner than later. 
And like I think someone like Martin Emerson could be a good scheme fit. Zion McCollin could be a good scheme fit. Armour Davis could be a good scheme fit. But there, there's a considerable gap here. Uh, so for me, it might be a little bit biased. I just think at the turn of things in 51, the edge market's going to be a lot more appealing than the corner market. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invoke my Gator bias and go Kyrie. I truly do believe 6-1, legit 4-3 speed, 4-3-7 speed, I believe it was. I think he has island potential. I think he can tackle in his own. I think he's a high character guy. was awesome for Florida. So I'm just going to evoke my slight Gator bias there at pick 18. So now going to 51, kind of exactly what I said. Massive drop off for the corners here. Also, just frustrating me picking at 51. There's always within like five, six picks going a little bit higher than that. Like just guys that are like, oh my God, why? Like if, if. Jalen Petrie, Devin Lloyd would fall to Philadelphia here at 51. That's an absolute dream scenario. Looking at the big board, no more Philadelphia needs to go. Honestly, at 51, if Brees Hall and Kenneth Walker are still there, I would highly consider that. Um, point being is that look at the 2023 Philadelphia Eagles running back room. It's Kenny Gainwell. That's it. I think there's value there, but I also think there's value in next year's running back class. Like, you can get running backs. Like, if Philly's going to have just Kenny Gainwell in next year's running back room, you could probably find a second-round running back next year that would be slightly comparable to these guys. So, while I, while I would say if this actually happened, I would be like, if they got Brees Hall, I'd be happy. I think if they got Christian Harris, Quay Walker, I'd be pretty happy. I think Benito would be interesting. I think... Winfrey would be like he's been a guy that I've done multiple Eagle mock drafts. He's my go to guy here at 51. But given the board, I think with Dupont Brisker still on the board, Philly has brought him in for a top 30 visit. That's kind of the easiest pick given the state of Philadelphia, given this I don't know, will they, won't they, in terms of signing the Honey Badger. It's turning into like a saga at this point. So, as far as we know, we still need corner. We still need a corner two. We need a guy that can play sooner than later. And we need a guy that can maybe be the long-term replacement for Darius Slay. Darius Slay is no spring chicken anymore. That could be Kyrie Elam. Look at our safety room. We got Anthony Harris on a one-year deal. We got Marcus Epps, who is not as bad as people assume. But Marcus Epps is a guy that's like a tweener starter. You'd rather have him just be okay, solid depth, and, and do a lot of his damage on special teams. Think of like a Chris Maragos type guy. So someone like Jaquan Brisker, high upside, very good athlete, brings the you know can bring the juice to the back end of the defense, sideline to sideline. Uh, I think that's a good fit for the Philadelphia Eagles, and the Eagles have also shown interest in him. So now we're here at pick eighty three, and there's just there's just no reason Brees Hall's still there. I'll tell you right now, Brees Hall's still there. That's my pick. That's that's an easy pick. But we are looking at the board here, four linebackers, and wow, Quay Walker is still there. I was thinking. Where did he go? Am I tripping? Where's Channing Tindall? Oh, he just went at 81. Uh, that would have been my pick. I, I think Tindall is a very intriguing linebacker, especially as a blitzer. But if this is the board, looking at the Philadelphia, I, I think it's down to two players, maybe even three players for me. Uh, we have Sam Williams, terrific pass rusher, a little bit of a work in progress as a run defender. D'Angelo Malone, who I'm pretty sure Philly brought in for a top 30 visit. He could plug and play, but like those two, you're hoping one of them is still there at 101. And even if not, you have Dominique Robinson, you have Isaiah Thomas, who's a productive run defender in the Big 12, uh, and pass rusher. He's made a lot of plays in the backfield. So like there is like really any of those guys still at 101. You feel pretty good about at, at, at edge. You look at the linebackers, it's a little bit thinner. And I really do think if Quay Walker's still there at 83, 6'4", 240. You look at the Philadelphia Eagles linebacking core. Quay Walker's probably more so would be competition for TJ Edwards. I think TJ Edwards is solid, but there is clear athletic limitation with Edwards. He can he can make plays in pass coverage because he's a very smart player. And I love TJ Edwards. He was a guy that when he um, was during the draft process and he slipped, he was my top guy, my number one UDFA signing for the Philadelphia Eagles. Go get TJ Edwards. How did he not get drafted? We got him. It was awesome. But he still... Reason why I went undrafted is is there's some athletic limitations. So at 83, I think given the board, while I would love to get one of these two, I think you'd have to go Quay Walker to kind of fix out the linebacker. So now we're back up at 101. Take a peek at the edge. D'Angelo Malone is still there. So that I'm not even going to look elsewhere. That is going to be my selection. A terrific athlete. Brings some juice for sure. I mean, you don't want 
Derek Barnett really having as many snaps as he had last season. He, you know, he's back. He's here for the considerable future. I think it's a three-year deal, but uh, I, I feel like that's kind of where you need to pull the trigger there for Philadelphia. Malone, very good athlete. Raz score, I think it's up in the nines. Very productive defender at Western Kentucky. And, and you can get some versatility. I think he can play on the line. I think he can maybe be a rotational guy along with Hassan Riddick at the Rush Sam spot. So there, there is some versatility. He's a good athlete to get out on the field. We are now back up on the clock at 124. This has been a popular pick for me to look at. And of course he's gone here. It's unfortunate. And it, there's no way Damian Pierce is going before Brees Hall. But I, this is where I like to look at Damian Pierce. He's my guy. That's my my second Gator bias that I want to kind of cash in there. But looking at really our board here, now it's Philly's really in a BPA scenario. I, I think now round four, round five, that Kenny Gainwell range is where you can look at bringing in another running back. You can look at bringing in a tight end too, even though we're moving J.J. Arthago white side of tight end. A more natural tight end like Jeremy Ruckert. Again, this is a, this is a problem with this mock draft. Oh, I can see it already. Is that the guys that are slipping are clearly guys that are like that? Those are easy selections for the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, but as it stands right now, I mean, looking at the fourth round, if Ruckert's still there, I mean, he has limited production that he could get slept on. Woods is the athlete. I like Kohler as, as a potential tight end target for Philadelphia. Um, I think Ferguson's interesting as well. Zach Tom would be nice. That's the versatile lineman. Uh, in terms of like a D tackle, and I don't really know how, how high Philly's going to want to draft a D tackle. They're, they're probably going to grab one. The board's not the best. You know, kind of looking at his. I know they brought Luketa in for a visit. He's going to be more of a Sam as well. I, I feel like he'd kind of be doubling up on D'Angelo Malone there. Looking at the corners that are available. There's a couple of interesting options. Again, I don't know how aggressive Philly's going to be at corners. We have a lot of young corners. There's not a lot of established corners, but you know, we got Tay Gowan from the Cardinals for Zach Ertz. You have Zach McPherson, who they, 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 they invested a decent pick in. Um... So it's tough to say, you know, how soon they would draft a corner again. So, uh, you know, we can look at safety. Philly could go to two safeties for sure. Honestly, uh, uh, JT Woods, just for that athleticism alone, wouldn't be – I'll see if we can get JT Woods in the fifth. 154 on this side, he's 164. That's about the range he's going anyways, fourth, fifth round. I wouldn't mind doubling up on safety. But, I mean, what do we got here? The tight end, man. I think I won't be tempted. I feel like we got very like Quay Walker as first round bust. I don't want to make this mock draft just drafting guys that are slipping in this simulation. So I, while I would say Jerry Ruckett's probably the best value at this point, I think for Philadelphia, someone like Zach Tom might be might be the more beneficial pick. Uh, I think with the Eagles, we know firsthand. You know, with two years ago where we had eighty seven different offensive line combinations, you could never have enough offensive line depth. Someone like Zach Tom, very good athlete, versatile. I feel like you can almost play him on any spot on the offensive line. Uh, I think that would be, in terms of value, that fourth-round value gives you some upside, especially you know if, if Kelsey retires, right? If Kelsey retires, they move Sayamala to center, you're going to need another guard. Tom can play that guard. Or Landon Dickerson, vice versa. Someone like Tom can step in, adds more versatility right along with you know the Nate Herbigs, who's solid, versatile, good depth. The, the Jack Jiskrels, who's solid versus all good depth. Zach Tom fits that bill. Very cheap, very affordable player for the next, you know, three, four years. Somewhere in that range. So now we're at pick five. We're going to go back to the ties. This one's a little bit more realistic. We're going to get Charlie Kohler there out of Iowa State. I think he's a really nice receiver. Good, you know, backup to what we have in in, in Dallas Goddard. I think Dallas Goddard hopefully can continue to break out. Uh, people need to put more respect on Dallas Goddard's name at this point. But I think Kohler's good value. Uh, now we're gonna, I think it could be a good time to get running back here, uh, and for Philadelphia, I think you want to look more for a power option. I, I think of the there are some power options here, some guys that are good good athletes. Uh, Ty, uh, Tyron Davis Price from LSU has some good power. Ingram has some good good power. Um, Abram Smith is a great power back, converted linebacker. Uh, in terms of value, I mean, bad. I'm, I'm a big Tyler Beatty fan, but he's he's too similar to what we have in Kenny Gamble. Pierre Strong, great speed, great straight line speed. But I think we need someone that can fill that Jordan Howard role. Uh, so really, it comes down to Rashad White and Zamir White. I think Rashad White is, you know, he had he had a really good combine, can catch the ball a little bit better. But I think the upside stands with Zamir White at this point. So that's where I'd go in the fifth round. Even though if I'm looking for a power back for the Philadelphia Eagles, I'm all on Damian Pierce for the Florida Gators. We have a fifth and seventh round selection here for Philadelphia. I mean... Now we're just kind of in like BPA. In terms of like what does Philly need, you'd love an interior D lineman. 
I think given the board, what is left at this point? I mean, Curtis Brooks is a good interior pass rusher. Noah Ellis, more of a nose tackle. Mark Graham Call, more of a nose tackle. Uh, Kalia Davis, more of a nose. Like, there, there's some options there. But for me personally, the value, I would honestly look here at Isaiah Thomas. I'd go back to edge, honestly. If he's still there, he was productive pass rusher, got some upside. And then again, same kind of deal for 237 in the seventh round. We really just got to go BPA. And and who's going to offer them? You know, I think it's not sexy, but Philly Pond needs a punter. Get the 4 5 6 40 punter here out of Georgia. I think Stout's from all the punting nerds. I, may, I mean that with full respect. Uh, sounds like he's a little bit higher up on, on people's boards. There's some people that rank him over uh, Matt Ariza. Um. I'm just double checking here, making sure just to put the you know put the uh, the icing on the cake here. How are we gonna finish this mock draft right? Given the quarterbacks, Co Kelly could be interesting. I, I do think we go punter and we'll go Jordan Stout out of Penn State. Uh, can't go really, you know. It's, there's there's three draftable punters: the Penn State kid, the Arizona, the San Diego State kid, and the Georgia. So there is my final Philadelphia Eagles mock draft. Really want to hear what you guys think, especially Eagle fans. How would you feel? About this, I really do. I would say, in terms of value, Quay Walker is the only surprising one, and I would just swap that with Channing Tindall, linebacker from Georgia. A little bit more realistic that Tindall would still be there around three. Currently, he's carrying like a three-four grade, where Quay Walker is kind of all over the place, but it feels fairly consistent that Quay Walker is more so a second-round guy. So swap out that for a Georgia linebacker. Everything else, you know, is a little bit risky. With you know, Willie's is, is could potentially, you know, is he going to be ready? Is he going to start on the season on IR? Is going to be 100 percent you know. And again, my logic in this one is thinking about the 2023 quarterback situation. Kyrie Elam, a little bit of gator bias, but when you have a guy that has island potential, which I firmly believe Kyrie Elam has, and, and you need to apply the same logic to Kyrie Elam that I think you a lot of people are applying to Derek Stingley. Where you look at the good, regardless of what year it is, and understand the circumstances and situation that he's been in. Kyrie was absolute beast, man. Uh speaking of. You want to see the best Kyrie Elam tape? Watch him lock up Jameson Williams when they play out Florida played Alabama. Brisker at safety, that'd be an awesome pick. I know a lot of Philadelphia Eagle fans want Jacon Brisker. And also a lot, I, I made a, a tweet saying, what, give me your picks. Give me your favorite picks, Eagle fans. Jameson Williams was the most favorite, was the most popular pick on Eagles Twitter. Along with Jaquan Brisker was on all the list. Uh, I don't really think anyone else was down this range. I saw a lot of Damian Pierce, but I think there's also a lot of Gator fans that follow me on Twitter. But I feel pretty good about this mock draft. Can't wait to see, you know, what Philadelphia does, actually, in real life. That's part of the draft. I can't wait to just overreact and lose my cool when they draft Drake London somehow, even though they've shown no real true interest in him. That's a Howie Roseman thing to do, but I can't wait for the draft. And I hope you guys join me here, most likely on Twitter, for my live draft stream. I'll be doing it Thursday night and Friday night. Give a live reactions, live grades, all that good stuff. So come hang out if you are around, and I'll see you guys then. But tomorrow we will do a full 32 team first round. I might do it second round, but most likely I'll just keep it to a first round mock draft. That's going to be kind of predicting who I think is going to draft what so that I, you know, you can kind of get some clout, some gloat a little bit on Twitter if you predict the right pick. Uh, so that'll be out tomorrow, and I'll see you guys then. Thank you very much for watching. As always, your first time stopping by, don't be afraid to hit that subscribe button, smash the like button if you enjoyed. And until next time, it's C4 saying peace out and fly, Eagles fly. Go, Birds.